All right. <clears throat> Welcome, everyone. My name is Bruno Oliveira, and I work with uh, Android Developer Relations. And we're going to talk about Enabling version 3. So uh, it's pretty cool. You know, Enabling is actually a pretty cool thing. And every time we talk to someone about Enabling, we sort of expect them to go like this. Uh, but sometimes in the previous versions of the API, if, if you've uh, worked with uh, Enabling v2, they sometimes go like that. And we totally don't, don't understand why that happens, because after all, Enabling is pretty easy to implement, right? So uh, just, just to go back in time a little bit, things used to be, well, things were actually pretty straightforward back then. Um, in v2, you would just have to make a purchase, kind of like that, and then that's done, right? Easy. Well, actually, I'm just oversimplifying a little bit. You actually had to have code to handle the purchase state changes, like that. But still, it's not, it's not that much code. OK, but then you had the, that case where uh, the app could be sleeping when you got that, uh, uh, that message. So you also had to have a broadcast receiver to make sure that that didn't, ha uh, didn't happen. So just broadcast receiver. Uh, so still not complicated, right? Uh, and then, of course, the broadcast receiver couldn't really run for very long because it would get killed by the system. So it's, it's probably good practice to implement a service, like a pretty simple and straightforward service to uh, handle that broadcast receiver. And of course, then, uh, since you can't query for the purchases uh, all the time because it's an, an expensive API call, you probably need to persist that using a database of some sort. But that's OK. Everyone loves databases. You know, it's uh, SQL. And well, why does it really get so complicated? And, and this is, a, this is even, even this is a, an oversimplification because you have to encrypt the uh, database to make sure that the users don't tamper with it. So why does it get so complicated with uh, in-app building in the previous versions? Well, let's start with the, uh, with the simple case. So the user, that, that, that's my, uh, my drawing of a user. Again, uh, it's probably fortunate that I, uh, I write code better than I draw pictures. But then the user buys something, and that gets delivered to the app. No problem there, right? So standard. But what happens if the application is not there to receive the package? Because applications on Android sometimes have other stuff to do. So sometimes apps go to sleep on Android. They take naps. So what if the app is sleeping? Then a different component has to pick up the package. And then that component has to take care of delivering the, uh, the item to the uh, application when it finally wakes up. And that's when the problems might happen, because that component uh, right there could end up losing your package. As you can see from this uh, diagram in V2, the developer had to write many components that had to work together to ensure that the, user, uh, the user's purchase went to the right place. And of course, it can, it can get a little complicated. In comparison, this is what the uh, V3 diagram looks like. Uh, actually, let me use a little bit more of the slide. No, let's make it a full slide. Uh, the diagram for V3 has seven subcomponents. We're going to spend the next several minutes discussing each component and subcomponent in detail. Actually, just kidding. This is the, this is the, the actual diagram. So the main improvement in v3, apart from the uh, from last boxes, is that API calls are now synchronous. This means that your application gets a response right away. So if I want to, and it's also much more straightforward to think about, too. So uh, if I want to buy something like 50 gold coins, all I have to do is make a request that, that looks like buy 50 gold coins. Then if uh, Google Play thinks the purchase is OK, it's going to return something that's uh, pretty intuitive, like say OK. So and it get that response right away. If you've worked with uh, V2 before, you're probably going to remember that our advice, the advice we gave every time is that listing items, like, which, which we call restoring purchases, was a very, very expensive operation. Nobody could afford to do that uh, uh, a whole bunch of times. So you couldn't just, uh, just get away with calling it every single time the app launched. You had to ha somehow keep a, uh, a client-side storage to know which items the user owns. So that's no longer the case, because in V3, Google Play implements a client-side cache and takes care of keeping that cache in sync with the server. So whenever you make your query uh, to the API, you're going to hit that client-side cache instead of incurring that cost of a network round trip. So you can call it as, as many times as you want. So listing the user's uh, items has actually become a pretty cheap operation. As you can, uh, and you can do that as often as you need. For example, you can do that every time the application starts, which we figure is a pretty natural place where you might want to ask yourself, what items does this user uh, own? All right, so I probably sound like I'm trying to sell you something, right? So if you're a developer, I mean, if you're in this room, you've probably grown a healthy mistrust over the years of people who stand on a stage like me and then don't show you any actual code. So let's, uh, so let's stop with the, uh, with the sales uh, and talk about something that's entirely different. Let's talk about selling stuff. So uh, before you can make v3 API calls, you have to check that it's actually supported. You can do that by, uh, by calling the uh, is billing supported API call. The good news is that in billing is actually supported on a whole variety of, of, of devices, so running Froyo and above, and a, recent, and, and a recent version of the Play Store. And that was actually more than 90% on the day that we launched, which was uh, like a few months ago. 
And, and right now, of course, that's much more than that. So you, uh, you don't have to be uh, too worried about that. Now, how do you go ahead and get a list of the items that the user owns? Well, you just call the uh, get purchases um, API call. And remember that this call is actually pretty cheap on v3. Notice also that you get the results right away, right there. So there's no funny callbacks or state management, no, no funny business you have to implement to get the, uh, the result right away. Um, all right, so now this is very important. It's, it's that single moment your application has been waiting for ever since the user launched it. It's that profound moment in modern technology that's very hard to explain to older uh, generations where the user actually realizes that the uh, virtual item or service that you're offering them is so valuable and they like it so much that they, are, that they are actually willing to give you real money for it. That's awesome, right? So it's at that singular moment, you have something that's really, 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 really very valuable. And I'm not talking about those 99 cents that you just made. Uh, what you have on that moment is the user's trust. So they give you their money and they expect to get something in return. And nothing is more valuable to an application than that. So what happens if at that critical moment, you take the user's money and then you lose a purchase? That's gonna be a very bad user experience. So again, they've uh, paid for something and didn't get it. The least you can expect after that is a pretty bad review. And of course, if you're unlucky, it may be very, very much worse than that, as this very reliable data that I in no way made up it clearly demonstrates. So you don't want the user to lose their purchase, ever. Which is why one of the central points in uh, V3 was to make it easier to do uh, exactly that. So it was to make it easier not to lose purchases. One of the ways we do that is by making all items managed, which means that Google Play keeps track of the ownership of those items for you. So going back to code, how do you write this uh, reliable purchase flow? First of all, you launch the purchase screen, and that can be done by calling get by intent. So uh, that's gonna get you a ready to use intent that you can then fire, and that's gonna bring you the purchase screen. And what does that look like? So I have a game called Nostalgic Racer, and then I have a thousand coins, a thousand nostalgic coins, if you will, and that the user can purchase. So it's notice that the, uh, this dialogue is, is pretty much it's simple and to the point, and the user doesn't uh, lose context because it's overlaid on top of the game. This is an improvement we uh, launched in the, uh, uh, I think, uh, a few months ago. So, and there's really only one button in that UI, and it really says click me, right? And so there's no context loss, no confusion. And the result of that dialogue when the user clicks buy is that you're gonna get the result through on activity results. So what do you do at that point? Well, at that point, you have the purchase result. So you have the response code, you have the purchase data, and the purchase signature, everything is right there. So uh, when, I, when I say purchase data, uh, what I mean is it's just this JSON object that looks kind of like that. So you have the order ID, you have the package name that bought the, uh, the product, you have the product ID, which is your, also known as your uh, SKU. You have the purchase time, the purchase date, the developer payload, that's something very important that we're gonna talk about next. And you have the purchase token, which is like an, a long alphanumeric string that identifies that particular purchase. So that's pretty much all there is for a simple application. So you, on startup, you call get purchases to figure out what the user owns. And then uh, when the user wants to purchase something, you call get by intent. That gives you a ready to use intent that you can fire. When you fire that intent, you get the purchase flow. And then on activity results, you handle that purchase. Notice that it's actually pretty hard to lose a purchase that way. You would actually have to make an effort to lose a purchase this way because even if the uh, unthinkable happens and say your application has a bug, uh, what happens if, if your application crashes right after the purchase and never gets the on-activity result? That's no problem because then the next time the user is gonna start the app, you're gonna call get purchases and you're gonna realize that the item is there. So the user has not lost the purchase. All right, so uh, phones are funny things actually. So they have a tendency to fall into all sorts of liquids, like from sea to margaritas. Uh, so they have a tendency, they have a, an, uh, an attraction to liquids that science doesn't explain. Uh, what also happens is that phones tend to fall. But as, as you know, contrary to popular belief, falling doesn't really do anything to a phone. The problem is when the phone collides with something massive, like say a planet. So the planet tends to win in that case. But don't worry, that's okay, because the beauty of managed in-app purchases is that they're like diamonds, they're forever. So even if the user deletes the app, or even if they switch to a different device, it's okay, because the purchase is still gonna be there, and they haven't lost it. So uh, this is good for things that the user should only purchase once. Like for instance, uh, a premium upgrade, even if the user switches phone, you don't, you don't want them to lose that. Uh, an ad-free upgrade, uh, special items that the user uh, can never lose, or even like uh, level packs, content, and so on and so forth. So for, for all that, it's uh, this uh, purchase once and, and use everywhere is, uh, is a pretty good approach. But sometimes, of course, uh, you don't want a purchase to be forever. You want th to implement things like consumable items, like health potions and whatnot. Uh, gold coins that you, uh, that you put into the player's wallet and then they go away, things that expire, like season passes. 
Uh, and then you have to, of course, to have purchases that are not permanent. And this is what uh, unmanaged item was used for in V2. But of course, there are no unmanaged items in V3. So how do you do that? Well, this is why we have the consumption APIs on V3. So to understand how this works, so somewhere in Google Play, so there's, there's a building uh, where Google Play works, and in, in the basement of, of that building, every single user at Google has a box. And inside that box, with my name on it, are all my virtual items. I know, I've been there, I've seen that box. Uh, when I buy a cool item, what happens is that somebody goes in, goes in there and puts the cool item inside my, the box that has my name on it. And from that point on, I know I own the cool item. When I subsequently ask what items does Bruno own through an API call, it returns, well, Bruno owns a cool item. Then what happens when I tell the API to consume a cool item? What happens is that the, game, the item goes up in flames, just like that. And then if I ask what, item, what items does Bruno own, I don't own anything at all. So consumption is the opposite of a purchase. When you consume, the item goes away. As far as code goes, this is how you consume an item. We just call the consume purchase uh, on the API, and then you give it the purchase token associated with that item. Remember that the purchase token is the same one that you got when you got the uh, get purchases call, and then the, uh, that's the purchase, uh, purchase token field on that JSON. Um, and then, uh, well, then you call that, and the item is going to be consumed. Now, there is uh, one decision that you're going to have to make, which is when to consume something. So it's up to you to decide how to use the consumption API. Uh, the contract is that when you consume something, it goes away. Uh, so we're going to talk about two of the most used methods when you are uh, using the consumption API. First of all, you should want to, you might, maybe you want to consume the item when it's actually used, because that's by far the most intuitive way to consume an item, right? Then you don't need to manage the items yourself. Now, the second approach, which is pretty popular, is to uh, consume it immediately upon purchase. In that case, your app takes care of managing the user's inventory. So you might call that inventory a wallet, a purse, a bag, account, uh, or, or any other name, but you manage the user's inventory in that case. So to, to, uh, to explain method one quickly, so let's give an example. So again, that's me, it's a stick figure, uh, stick figure uh, character of me anyway, somewhat slimmer. Uh, and those are the items that I own in Google Play. So right now it's an empty box, right? Now, as we all know, uh, the world out there is a pretty dangerous place, especially for stick figure characters like myself. So I decide that before I go out into the world, I'm gonna buy a health potion. So I buy a health potion, and when I do that, uh, it appears in my inventory. Also, like everybody else, I walk around with a hit point bar on top of my head that tells me what my life points are. So now I have a potion that I bought, and it's on my box in Google Play, and I own that potion. Now I go out, and then I uh, venture into the, uh, uh, into the wild lands of bugs, and then I battle bugs, and then I write code. Pretty soon I realize that I'm starting to get low on life points, and then I decide to consume the potion. That's when your application would call the consumption API to make that potion disappear and then restore my life point bar back to what, what it was before. So this is consumption upon usage. Now, that's a perfectly good method, except that it has one fundamental limitation, and that has to do with how Google Play thinks about numbers. So Google Play, as, at least as far as internet purchases are concerned, only really knows two numbers, and they are zero and one. So if the world out there is really, really dangerous, and I think I'm gonna need more than one healing potion out there to battle bugs, then I'm gonna wanna buy two potions. So, but what happens if I try to buy a potion when I already have one? So Google Play is gonna look at me, and it's gonna see that I have a potion right there, and it's gonna say, that makes no sense. You already have a potion, why are you trying to buy a second one? So clearly, this approach doesn't work if you wanna have more than one item of each kind, which is why method two might come in handy, which is consuming upon uh, purchase. In this case, your application is actually responsible for managing the user's inventory. So notice my uh, excellent rendering of a plastic bag right there, which is my client-side inventory, or server-side. Either way, it's managed by my application. So I buy a potion, and now the potion exists in my Google Play inventory. Then what I do is, regardless of when the user is gonna consume this, I consume the potion right away through the API, and I credit that to my in-game inventory. Uh, and then if the user buys the second one, that's no problem because Google Play doesn't know about a potion anymore. So I can buy a second potion, then consume it right away and credit it to my bag. So now I have two potions in my inventory. If you're using method two, it's very important to uh, not only to consume upon purchase, but also upon startup. Uh, because, and then on startup, you check if there are any outstanding items that you should be consumed. This is gonna be necessary, for, for example, if your application crashed before it consumed the item. So suppose the user made the purchase, uh, the purchase went through, but then your application crashed. Then when your application recovers and starts again, you're gonna make sure that uh, on startup, you check if there's any item uh, in the user's inventory that should have been consumed but was not. So in our example, what I'm gonna do on startup is check the, uh, it's called get purchases, and if I realize that I own a potion that should have been consumed, 
I'm gonna consume it right away and then put it into the player's inventory. You don't even have to, uh, to notify the player that you're actually doing that. You can do that in the uh, background. So summarizing what, what we have so far, on startup you would call get purchases, then if I notice that there is a portion there that should have been consumed before, I consume it. When the user wants to make a purchase, I call get by intent and then launch that intent to get the purchase flow and that's the, uh, the window that prompts the user to buy something. Then when I get the on activity result callback, what I do is I check if the purchase was successful and then I consume the purchase if the purchase was successful and then when, uh, when I get the uh, consume callback, I see if the consume was successful. If the consume was successful, then I finally add the potion to the inventory. It's very important to wait for the last part before you actually credit the item to the user's inventory because uh, what may happen is that, remember that the uh, Google Play inventory is the same for every device. So it's, it's, it's per user and not per device. So if I own a potion on one device, then I own a potion on all devices. So when you are gonna consume that potion, uh, you should make sure that, the, uh, that, only one, that you only credit the potion once. So if you try to consume the same potion from several devices, only one of those consumptions is gonna succeed. So that's guaranteed. So this means you should only credit the potion once it's been successfully consumed. All right? So in Appealing V3 also brings a long anticipated feature that developers have been really asking for, for a long time, which is the ability to query for a product's details uh, from, from code. Like for instance, title, description, and price. So if you take a look at the API, you're gonna find this method call, which is called get SKU details. It's, a, it's actually pretty, pretty straightforward. You just specify the list of SKUs that you wanna get information about, and when you make that call, the API returns the information in a bundle. And that bundle kind of looks like this. Um, so it has your product's uh, ID, which is the SKU, the type, whether it's an in-app product or a subscription, the price, the title, description, so on and so forth. Uh, one thing that's pretty nice about this is that the, uh, the price is actually returned in a way that's formatted according to the user's locale. So it's gonna look right to the user when you display it on the screen. However, one thing to be careful about is that that price is, that price is only formatted for uh, display and not for parsing. So don't try to use that as a number, don't try to add two together. Uh, this is just a number that's formatted for display only and you can show it to the user. Now, let's talk about subscriptions. So in V3, that's actually pretty simple too. If you've used V2, remember that there, there was like a whole bunch of uh, messages and callbacks and broadcast receivers that you had to uh, write to implement them to know the status of a particular subscription at any given time. And there were like asynchronous callbacks that you had to implement. But in V3, it's much easier. They are actually just like items. They're much simpler. Uh, to check what subscriptions are supported, I mean, to check if subscriptions are supported, you can call these billing supported API call. So the same as before, except you, you, uh, you pass subs instead of in-app, and then uh, that's gonna return whether or not subscriptions are supported on that device. So it's important to make that check. Now, launch, launching the purchase flow for a subscription is not really very different from launching the purchase flow for a regular item. So you just use get by intent, but except that instead of uh, saying in-app, you say subs, and then you will pass the item type and then you get, the, get an intent. And the intent. You can launch the intent and that brings the, uh, the purchase window just like we did before. Uh, one thing to, uh, uh, to be careful about is that subscriptions can't be consumed. So you cannot use the consumption API on a subscription. If the uh, effect that you're trying to accomplish is to cancel a subscription, then this is not the way to do it. You're gonna have to do that through the uh, server side uh, as we're gonna see next. Um, all right, so remember how uh, I said that in V2, it's actually pretty difficult to know what's the state of a subscription. So in V3, it's actually pretty easy because you just call get purchases. When you call get purchases with the item type set to subs, uh, it's gonna return all the subscriptions that are, are actually active right now. What I mean by actually active is that, well, subscriptions that are either in the active state or in the trial state, you know, the trial state that the user can have before buying the subscription, those are gonna appear in your get purchases uh, results. Now, once the subscription expires, uh, you're not gonna get any, any notification of that, but then the next time you call get purchases, which remember became a pretty cheap call, so every time your application starts, you can, you can call get purchases. So the very next time you call get purchases, what's gonna happen is that the expired subscription is not, no longer gonna be there. So it doesn't appear on get purchases. So your whole logic can be, if I see the subscription in get purchases, then I provide the content. If I don't see the subscription in get purchases, then I don't provide the content. That's much, much easier logic than trying to manage uh, what's the subscription state at any, any given point. Uh, so how about cancel subscriptions? Well, we do the right thing for cancel subscriptions as well, which is cancel subscriptions are actually gonna appear in get purchases until, that's, uh, until the end of the billing period that the user has paid for. So after that expires, they cease to appear. So you may, be, you may see cancel subscriptions in get purchases, and that may happen because the user has paid for the billing period, but they have canceled it, so on the next billing period, that subscription is gonna expire. So 
as far as, uh, as the developer is concerned, all you have to do is check if it's in get purchases. If it is, you deliver the content. If it's not, uh, you don't deliver. Now remember that Google Play actually now has a local cache on the client, which means that when a subscription expires, it might actually take some time for it to disappear from get purchases. Usually that doesn't really take more than 24 hours, of course. Uh, so that cache is refreshed uh, uh, every 24 hours at most. So you might actually see a subscription there that has already expired, but then uh, hopefully that's on, only gonna last 24 hours or so. That, that's, not, that's usually not a big deal. All right, so when you're making any API calls, it's very important to be careful about the UI thread. So the UI thread is something that's very delicate. Uh, why? Because if you block the UI thread, your application is gonna stop responding, of course. And the, in the Android world, and I mean, I mean actually in, in any mobile application, that's not just something that's frowned upon, you know. It's your system, the system actually punishes your app for that. And the punishment, of course, is this very, very friendly uh, dialog box. So if you, wanna, if you don't want the users to see this dialog box, because users just absolutely love that dialog box, then you shouldn't ever block the UI thread by calling methods that take a long time to return. Particularly in the uh, in-app billing API, uh, the safe ones to call are is billing supported and get by intent. Those two you can call safely from the UI thread because they return right away. Now, the other three that we talked about are not safe to call from the UI thread because they might actually take a while to execute. So if you're calling get purchases, consume purchases, get SKU details, Remember that they, may, they might actually take a while to execute. So you, you definitely do not want to call them from the UI thread in, in order not to risk a uh, application not responding error. So always call them from a separate thread, async task, whatever else, but whatever you do, don't block the UI thread while waiting for that, that response. If you download the sample that's called uh, Trivial Drive, it implements that for you because it, it has uh, asynchronous wrappers uh, so, so that you can actually call them from the UI thread and get a callback when they, uh, when they are done. Now, many developers uh, don't know this, but there's, uh, there's actually a server-side API uh, that allows you to check for subscriptions. The way it works is uh, this API uh, allows you to, uh, to take a particular subscription and then query whether or not it's valid, uh, when it's gonna expire, and whether or not the, uh, it's gonna renew itself automatically. It also allows you to cancel an existing subscription from the server side. So uh, how, do you, how do you go ahead and specify a particular subscription? Well. Uh, remember the, uh, the purchase data on the client side when you, get, uh, when you call get purchases? So one of the fields in that is called purchase token. So that identifies that particular subscription, uh, subscription for that particular user. So that's the, uh, the string that you need to use on the server side uh, to call that API. So this is what, I'm, uh, what a sample API call looks like. Uh, it's, uh, it's basically REST, and I'm calling the, uh, the state of that particular subscription. So I pass the, your package name goes there, your subscription ID, so this is the SKU of the uh, subscription goes there, and then that's the token that you get from the uh, client side. The response looks something like this, and it gives you when the subscription started, when it's gonna expire, uh, and then whether or not it's gonna renew automatically. Uh, if you wanna know more about this API, uh, there's that URL right there, so there, there's the uh, full specification of that API. It also allows you to uh, cancel a, subscri a subscription from the uh, server side, which might be useful for your uh, application. Now, next, let's talk about a very important topic. Uh, which is security. Now, security is important because, believe it or not, uh, there are some shady characters out there in the interwebs who might want to take your stuff without paying. Uh, I know, it's shocking. Uh, and they are out there on the web, on the loose. So it's very important to implement some measure of security in applications. So I, I don't really know what, what the technical term is, but I'm gonna say they're pirates, mostly because we spent a really long time drawing this character and I wanted to use it in a presentation. So uh, actually, I think they're, they're, they're called crackers, but let's go with pirates. Uh, so anyway, anytime you see a purchase result in your application, you should always ask yourself if you should trust the purchase or not. Of course, a pirate's job is gonna be, pirates spend all day being a pirate, and their job is to convince you that a particular purchase uh, is correct. And of course, your job is to detect that lie and see that that purchase is a fake. So how do you go ahead and do that? Well, depending on, on the, your particular type of, uh, uh, of app and market, piracy might be a, a small problem, might be a big problem, that's gonna depend on your type of app. But you should always think in terms of a risk model uh, that takes into account several variables, such as the uh, target order, audience, the item's value, the likelihood that somebody would make a fake purchase, uh, the technical difficulty in making a fake purchase, and based on that, you make a decision on how much security to implement. Of course, in the best case scenario, implement all possible security, uh, but then uh, you might have to balance that against engineering time and so on and so forth. So it's important to be uh, conscious of that. Of course, nobody can stop piracy altogether. I would be lying to you if I said that I had a method to stop piracy. Uh, but of course, you should always make life hard for pirates because that's fun. Uh, so here are some, some of the defenses that you can employ uh, to make a pirate's life hard. Uh, first of all is use our developer payload 
and then use signature verification and also server-side validation. We're gonna give a quick overview of each one of those. So what's this uh, developer payload thing? Well, developer payload is really just a fancy term for a tag. So it's just a tag that gets attached to a particular purchase. Uh, it's an arbitrary string. Anytime you launch the purchase flow, you can specify what the string is. It's just a string that gets attached to the purchase. And then every single time you query for that purchase and you get that purchase, that string is gonna be there. Now, of course, you can write anything into it. Uh, but of course, one of the most useful uh, applications of this is to identify the owner of a particular purchase. Why do you wanna identify the owner of a particular purchase? Because then you make it really hard for somebody to take that purchase data and then replay it into a different device. So, uh, so that's, again, that's, that's me. It's a stick figure, of course. Uh, like everyone else, I mean, it's a scientific fact. It's been scientifically proven that everyone, everyone has an evil twin somewhere. Now, this is Onurb, my evil twin. He is not nearly as honest as I am. So last week, he picked up my device and did a database dump of the items that I had and then replayed, the, uh, replayed them on his device, hoping to get some of my items for free. So, of course, if your application is using developer payload, this is what's gonna happen. So Onurb, my evil twin, is gonna run your app. And then you're gonna check what items does Onurb own, and you're gonna see this purchase. Do you, th do you see anything suspicious at all about this purchase? Well, of course, the developer payload says it belongs to Bruno, but it's Onurb that's running the app. Of course, on a real application, you would not use uh, first names, because some people have evil twins that have the same first name. So you would not, you would not use names, but something, some uh, uh, unique ID, like for instance, the uh, Google Plus ID or something like that. Also, it's, it's actually pretty hard to fake that signature because every purchase comes signed uh, from the server, so it's not, not actually trivial just to change that purchase. So speaking about signature verification, well, what is this, this thing about signature verification? Well, every application has a public key and a private key. The private key never leaves Google, so the private key is only known to Google, uh, and you know the public key for your application. What this means is that uh, whenever somebody signs something with your private key, and that of course by definition has to be Google because we're the only ones that have the, uh, the, the private key, then you can use the public key for your app to verify that signature to know that we signed it. So Google Play signs every single purchase that, uh, that goes through Google Play gets signed with your application's private key, which means that when you get a purchase on your application, you should use your application's public key to check that the, uh, that the signature matches. If it does not, it's a fake. It's not actually difficult to implement signature verification, but if you, if you don't wanna implement that, that's actually available in our sample. So Trivial Drive has a helper class that does all, all that signature verification for you. So you don't even have to implement that. Now, all right, even though uh, client-side signature verification is, is pretty cool, right? Uh, then, uh, but don't think that client-side client security alone is gonna be enough for your app. That would be a mistake, because regardless of how difficult you make things, uh, the re reality is that, that phones can be hacked. So you should definitely secure the server side as well. So uh, when we say server side verification, what we mean is that on the server side, you should check the signature again, uh, just to make sure that the client is not compromised. And then one cool thing you can do on the server, which you, cannot do, which you can't do on the client, is that you can check the order number, because the server is seeing every single purchase that comes from every single person. So every purchase com comes with an order number, and they should be unique. So if you ever see a second purchase with the same number as the purchase that you've already provisioned before, then you know that that second purchase is a fake. Uh, so you should always check the order number and dedupe it. Also, uh, if you're doing this, make sure to secure the handshake because I've seen pretty sad stories of developers that spend countless uh, man hours uh, devising this perfect server-side security system and then their handshake was like a Boolean call, uh, it was like a REST call that returned a Boolean saying true, you are validated or not. And then of course that can be easily circumvented uh, with a man in the middle attack. So make sure that the handshake is secure. If you're, if you're going through the trouble of implementing a server-side security like that, also make sure that the handshake be between the server and the client is secure and not trivial to break. Now, to give a summary of the security methods that we talked about, of course, you're free not to do anything. If you don't do anything, then you're pretty much vulnerable to any attack. Maybe for your application, that, 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 that's, that's not gonna matter, but then uh, you should probably just add at least client-side uh, security. Because if you at least add client-side signature verification, that's actually very easy to do because it's, it's implemented for you. It's, it's, uh, it's available in the sample. It's just a matter of copy and pasting that. So if you add client-side signature verification, you're pretty much gonna be, you're gonna be protected against man-in-the-middle attacks. So you're gonna be protected against everyone's evil twin uh, who tries to uh, replay a purchase on a different device. Now, if you wanna go the extra mile and then add a uh, unique developer payload, of course, you are uh, also protected against, against the, the more elaborate forms of purchase replay. And next, uh, if you wanna be really secure, you should, of course, implement server-side signature verification. 
So server-side signature verification is going to protect you even in the, in the case that the uh, client's phone is hacked and then the framework has been compromised. So definitely implement, think about implementing uh, server-side security. Well, so overall, it's important to approach the uh, problem of piracy in a very rational way, and that means don't panic and implement uh, methods that are known to be effective. So at least as far as the enabling platform is concerned, these are the three that, that, that we talked about, and they are definitely the other ones that you should have in mind because they're very easy to implement. So developer payload, uh, that identifies the user, of course, uh, then signature verification, and also uh, doing server-side validation. Um, and the last topic for today, it's something that developers have been asking us for a long time. So I'm actually glad that this launched. Uh, so, and this is the enabling sandbox. So what's the sandbox thing? Well, if you remember uh, how things used to be, when you wanted to test to make sure that your in-app building implementation was working right, uh, you essentially had two choices when testing in-app purchase. You could just use the uh, test queues, you know, the, uh, the purchased and the canceled queues, and then, which are, of course, fake product codes, and they always return a given uh, purchase result. So you could, of course, use that, and those are, of course, mock products with a mock purchase flow. They don't, don't actually go through the server. Uh, and then they get a mock result. Of course, uh, if you were not satisfied with that, and of course, uh, if you wanted to uh, do something that's closer to production, you couldn't use that, you could use a test account. And of course, uh, if you list somebody as a test account, the only privilege they used to have is that they could make purchases from an application that was not yet published. But uh, you had to use real money. You had to use a real credit card, you had to use a real purchase flow, and then you would actually get charged for that. Of course, you could revert the charge by uh, refunding it, but then maybe the bank's not gonna be happy, and so on and so forth, but it's just, uh, it's just very complicated. So with in Epping Sandbox, you can now test purchases with the real products using the actual real purchase flow with a real credit card, so everything is as real as possible, except that that last step, when your credit card is about to be charged, that doesn't happen. So that's the only part that's, uh, that's, uh, that's mock. So that's the only part that doesn't happen is you don't get charged, but otherwise uh, the whole flow is actually real. So how do you go ahead and set this up? To enable that, you simply add some test accounts uh, to the list of test accounts in the publisher site. So this is the uh, Android publisher site. You go to account details, then you add a list of test accounts over there. So some Gmail accounts that you want to test the app with. So apart from uh, those accounts, apart from being able to purchase from your unpublished app, uh, What's gonna happen when you try to publish with any of those accounts is that you're gonna see a screen just like this. So do you notice any difference from the screen uh, that we saw before? It's exactly the same one, except there's warning saying this is, a, this is a test purchase and you won't actually be charged, but everything else is gonna work exactly in the same way as a real purchase would. So this means that you can uh, test your in-app purchase in, a, in an environment that is pretty much uh, uh, identical to the, to the real life production system, uh, but you won't actually be charged. Um, of course, if you want to see the uh, Enabling version 3 code in practice, we have a sample called Trio Drive. So it's an exciting driving game that I wrote. Uh, so you get to burn fuel and then buy more fuel. It's kind of like the experience of having a car in real life. And it's available through uh, the SDK manager. And it's also available through the uh, Google Code site. I recommend that you get the code directly from uh, Google Code site because that's, uh, that's a more, uh, it's more up to date there. And pretty soon we're gonna uh, launch an update to that, to, to, to that app that's gonna include self-driving cars. So summarizing, uh, we talked about the uh, most challenging points of in-app building v2. We talked about how in-app building v3 was designed to address those points and make things much easier for developers. We talked about subscriptions, we talked about new API features such as consumption. We talked about the, uh, the new product details API feature. Then we talked about the uh, server API and give some pointers on security best practices. And we also presented the uh, IIB sandbox, which makes it much easier to test your apps in a, in a real environment. So the reason we are improving the API constantly and adding these new features is that we are always trying to, striving to improve the developer experience because we, we know that if we, uh, if we give you a, a good experience as, as a developer, you can focus on what makes your apps great. So you can make a better experience, experience for your users, which is everybody's final goal. So I hope that, uh, that the tips that I gave you are useful in that respect. And I thank you very much for coming to this session. If you have any, any feedback, uh, there's the Rate This Session poster over there. On previous IOs, I know that we had real life tomatoes you could throw on stage, but then that, 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 that was pretty messy. Uh, so if you wanna give your feedback, just scan the QR code over there, or use the, uh, the Google IO uh, app to give your feedback. So thank you very much.